So um, why don't we go ahead and start? So why don't we take the roll call? So uh, Alan, I'm here. You're here, Jim, you're here. I'm here, and I'm here. So we've got uh, we've got a quorum. Uh, first up, public comments. Of course, when we go through each of the items, we'll be able to speak about those as well. But is there anything you'd like to bring to the attention of the, with two members of the public? Three, you, you of course, you're welcome to speak as well. Do, you, do we have anything specific you'd like to bring? I'm interested in the capital budget discussion, and we'll okay. wait for that. Great, okay. And any discussion from our filming crew? Okay, good. All right, well, we'll move to the regular agenda. Uh, first off is the the minutes that were distributed out. Does anybody have any minutes or comments? I agree with both of them. Okay. Uh, second. All right, all in favor? All right. All right, thank you very much. Approved. Next item on the agenda is to recommend asset allocation strategies for the irrevocable trust for our retiree health care. Now this is something that the, the Finance Committee started, passed a while ago. Then um, we wanted to determine what type of uh, uh, mechanisms and that we were going to invest in and we'd asked Everett to look into that. And of course the council has given their approval to move forward with this trust. We just need to now make a recommendation on it. Correct. So I've asked the Finance Committee to provide me with maybe some strategy or some strategic advice of how to go ahead and set up the investment portfolio. Um, we've invited Andrew Brown to come and speak to us and answer any questions. Um, he's the investment manager for PARS and we'll be working closely with him. And so I think I will, um, yeah, and, and just to repeat, the council did adopt the resolution to um, advise the city manager to enter into the trust. So it's just a matter of setting up the accounts and transferring over the money. And it will be my intention to transfer over the money as soon as the actuarial study is complete. They, um, I've been talking to them the last few weeks and they're behind. So they probably won't have it finished by June 30th, but in July they will have it complete and we'll be able to transfer the money over as soon as um, they complete their work. I noticed today in the newspaper, I don't know if it affects this or not, that Calpers is now saying that they really don't think they're going to be able to make the 7.5%. That's correct. <laughs> Having lost 4.3 in the first yeah. half of the month. I mean, and there's it, still two more weeks left in the year. <laughs> but, but you never know. You never know. But you know, that's what we've always suspected. But I don't know if that affects us or not. I think it might. It doesn't affect this at all, yeah. but it does affect our PERS rates. And I can I actually want to set up a, a meeting with the two of you to talk about the PERS side funds, and I can go into that in more okay. detail. Right. But it does not affect the irrevocable trust or the um, actuarial amount for the retiree medical benefits, which is what this is for. Okay. It does affect the um, pension amounts. Okay. Well, I've been, you know, reflecting on this. I think on one issue, I believe strongly against uh, uh, managed accounts. There's so much research that says that uh, so much research that says that uh, actively managed portfolios don't beat the market, mm -hmm. and that you're better off with uh, very low cost uh, index funds. Mm -hmm. And that conclusion has been reached by so many. You know, sensible, mm -hmm. well documented. So I and I really object when I read about uh, in CalPERS they're paying huge amounts of money to all these cronies to uh, manage the portfolio. You don't have any experience. Yeah, and they're not being held accountable to. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I'll done What? <laughs> oh, Jim, <laughs> you're not suggesting. <laughs> well, anyway, so that's thing one. Thing two, it seemed to me. A sensible thing to do would be to create a ladder of fixed income securities to match the liabilities. I trust we can project the liabilities so that each year we have fixed income securities maturing that year. I realize it's kind of a problem when fixed income, you know, the Fed has driven the interest rates down to close to zero, but 
No, that's a good idea. And anyway, idea. we want to be sure that we have the money and that we don't hit a bump where we need the money now to pay and, and there's a big hole because the market's gone down. So you would say, based on this uh, yeah. comment here, that we go with the index plus passive? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. The index, yeah. But then I think you're also saying with your ladders is that we do a determination of what our costs will be more or less on a year by year basis or close to that and then and then some of the investment strategies would be in things that as they would come to and yeah. they mature, mature at the year that we would need them and that would then provide the, the funds for that yeah. year and perhaps the subsequent year but that's going to require a little bit of analysis but that's a great idea yeah i, I don't know what how long the ladder should be i was thinking maybe it should be 10 years or five years you know there he says well this market goes down it always recovers within five years so that we need expert advice on that but well that's what i suggest anyway yeah, it's, um, would it be okay if we hear from Andrew and have him uh, explain kind of the setup of what the fund okay. you know, yeah. offers, yeah, let him get the overview, and um, based on his review of, of um, mm -hmm. and listening today okay. right now, he can give us a recommendation. Yeah, I think, it, and I think that the information that, that you know, Alan just brought up, I think, you know, gives you a little flavor of kind of what, where we, you know, some of the things we'd like to get sure. to, and mm -hmm. you can then maybe yeah. that tail end. There's not a lot of enthusiasm for actively managed portfolios around here. <laughs> Just you or everybody? <laughs> we, have, we have two products. One's an actively managed based platform, and one's an index based platform. Um, typically, though, what I do before I enter into this arena, this environment, is, and, and by no stretch do I have a black belt in actuarial studies, I'm a portfolio manager, but you know, I, I do look at a document like this, and this is your actual evaluation, uh, Nikolai. Yeah, and probably consulting. Uh, uh, constructed this on, uh, well, for the period starting January 1st, 2009. And, and I go through this document and then I look at the, the, the State of the Union, so to speak. And, and so you're initiating this plan. So we're starting on day one. And then your liabilities are, are several million. And, and, I, and I think you start with 1.2, $1.3 million in initial funding assets. Um, so your point, Alan, about trying to develop sort of an immunized portfolio where you, you have these bonds roll off and then yeah. they're matched to your liabilities. Um, great game plan, but... Uh, you don't have enough money. To you don't have enough money, yeah. yeah. But, <laughs> you know, um, but eventually, someday, hopefully in the near future, you will. Yeah. Um, so, so right now, what I try to do is, is give a, my best recommendation in terms of your actual rate puts an expected rate of return, a discount rate, whatever you want to call it. Uh, target rate of return of a certain amount. So, so CalPERS is 7.75%. So if, if Nikolai would have taken that 7.75%, then what I try to do is come up with an asset allocation that I believe, that my firm believes, that has the best probability of attaining that you know, bogey, if you will, over, over a long period of time. Uh, Nikolai puts in this report 4%. So 4% is not a, a discount rate that, that, that one you don't really need to set up this kind of trust to hit 4% over the long haul. Um, so, so, so ideally, you, you would want to pick a number a little bit north of 4%. Um, so you get the benefits of, of you know, the, the longer horizon, taking more risk in, in the investment allocation. Of course, with the more risk, you, you just think the last four or five years, you, you have seen the ups, uh, 2009, 2010, also seen the downs, 2008. So, so I do try to counsel the councils, uh, the committees that I work with, that you know, uh, th these allocations do come with a certain amount of risk. More if you want 7.75, less so if you're looking for for five or, or maybe six percent uh, expected rates of return. And since we're working on our actuarial study right now, depending on what type of asset allocation strategy we want to follow, Nikolai can put that in the next report, and it will change. Um, what the numbers are yeah, so because change. when they put this report together it was on the pay as you go we're holding our own money so of course we have to put the lower interest rate in once you move to a trust it allows them to bump up the expected uh, but, rate I mean six percent in my mind at the moment seems like awfully optimistic the way things are now it's rude to answer right. your question with another question but, but let me ask you why you think six percent is, is a little bit difficult well I mean I look at 
all interest rates at the moment and projecting for the future, yep. at least for the next two or three years, are virtually nothing. Yeah, and, and, and that's why I, I asked the question, because, because a lot of people think it's really the stock side. Oh, there's so much risk with Europe and, and the fiscal cliff that that's going to be a challenge for, for equities. And it certainly might be the case, but it is really the fixed income. It's a fixed income that, that when we look at the fixed income markets, uh, you said the next two to three years, we would take it up to three to five years. We don't think that you're going to hit on, on a fixed income portfolio more than 3%, 2 to 3%. For, for, the, for that period of time. So, so when you're looking at our, our four investment objectives and the asset allocations that, that, that you know, are embraced by those investment objectives, it, it is very, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, I wish you have to temper your expectations. I wish I could get 6% at home. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so one thing to consider is, is yes, the next three to five years, uh, you know, slim pickings, um, the lake is not exactly stocked with a whole lot of fish. Longer term, Perhaps a more reasonable, or not more reasonable, but traditional. Traditional, thank you. Uh, rate of maybe five, five and a half uh, for fixed income investing might be more in the ballpark. Well, so, so, so yeah, we need to look at the short term, but we also do need to think about the long term. But the trouble with the fantasy rates, you know, above seven percent, is then that leads them to go into more ever more risky uh, investments. I don't think it's smart for us to uh, pick an ambitious rate and then let that drive us into a more risky portfolio. I, I agree. I think that uh, we just got four here with the minimum amount of cash that we have. I mean, we don't have a lot of cash, even for my son. We don't. And I think we can't really afford to take much risk. That's my feeling. So we got a million two in the fund. Correct. So the cash is defined. How many years? How much? How many years of OPEBs? Is a million two. Um, Maybe I should let you talk. No, no. I there, there's I've learned there's times when I open my mouth and there's times I let you know definitely let the committees talk because because this is important because committees definitely need to understand the risk tolerance. I can tell you from where I sit. What do you mean? At one point two million? It's a good start. You have a thirty year horizon. You're going to have, you're going to have a 30-year horizon. Oh, wait, 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 wait. How many employees do we have? Yeah. Sorry. 30-year amortization shoot, shoot, is what they shoot for when no, you do the amortization. You have a 30-year. Your study uh, has, what, 51 no, actives? No. Well, the actuarial study Well, the actuarial study was based on the employees as of... of right, so why is that out of date? Well, well, I'll explain again. to you what the law says. It says this one was done as of... January 1st, 2009. So the population was for that, um, the current employees at that time. We are doing it again for July 1 of, is it July 1? Um, it's um, change, of 2011. So it's still not going to take into account the current staffing. It's going to be an actuarial study based on that. And why that's we, what the law requires. Why, why aren't we doing it as of 12? Um, because we have to update it every two to three years. We? The, the town is required to do it. Gasby. 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 No, but most companies aren't even funding. So don't we have latitude on where we make the studies? For financial reporting, I believe a town of our size is required by Gasby to do it every three years. Sure. PERS requires every two years, but we're not entering into a PERS trust, so we don't have that requirement. Um, so we are due for updating it for financial statement purposes to be in accordance but with the But it's, it's unrealistic. I mean, we get one third of fewer employees. I mean, the, why, why waste the money? I mean, that would be because right. because we're required to buy. Hey, well, uh, buy we got to use some judgment. But well, think, there is an option for small um, agencies, and um, PARS definitely promotes utilizing. I can't remember exactly what it's called, an alternate method. And so you can go through and do an update of your actuarial study using the alternate method if you're a smaller agency and. Um, and updated in the future using that method, which I think also the PERS Trust doesn't necessarily allow for that as much as um, well, we're could we do it as of July this year? Yeah, why, we're why doing it as of July of last year yeah, because no, question, it has so to be updated we, every... Can we do it as of July this year? And then I realized that that might we violate that Gatsby, right now. but we could put in a footnote, we humbly apologize that we violated Gatsby, but common sense overruled. We don't have the July 1 data right now, and... and Ooh, well, two weeks. 
I'll have a follow-up uh, conversation with you on that, but well, I don't want an unqualified opinion on my audit report, and I believe that's what you would get. There's a qualified there's opinion on that? Unqualified. An unqualified opinion if you didn't okay. have an updated uh, report. I'm not sure. We can talk to the auditors and find out. I can't believe that. Okay, well, We're already engaging well, okay. in doing our study, though, okay, just well, so I, you know, it's in okay. process. Okay, so I, think, I, I, think it, I think it's proven. I think yeah. it's proven, you know, and I think the, the committee's opinion is, is that it would be proven to speak with the auditor. We don't want to, you know, have black marks against us, but we want to do the sensible thing. And the, you know, the condition of the, of the town has changed since Correct. 2011, July, and, and you know, slipping it or doing an addendum. I mean, if, 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 if the, we need to do as of July 2011, here's what it stood, and then you have an addendum and says, but as of July 2012, here we are, and is, is it an updated addendum? If, if there's some requirement that we need to do something because the two-year period expired, and we'd be in some violation, and you do the 2000. Uh, 11, and then you do an addendum 2012 that perhaps comes, you know, is based on July 1, and then we make our decisions based on the addendum. I have talked to the actuary, and based on the knowledge that he has of what our current status is, he is willing to put that into the assumptions. So I believe the study that he is going to present to us in a month and a half or to two months will be able to incorporate our current status. It okay. just has an official valuation date. Um, prior to when we've actually All right, so that's, that's what we want. Yeah. yeah, because I, how many employees do we have now? 38. A maid, two, is 38 employees isn't enough. Um, it, it also considers the retirees. The how many retirees, retirees do we have? Um, 51. Let's see, that's active. that's active. Retirees, there were 18 when this is done. Of course, we have more now because we just had a bunch of retirements last year. So roughly over the next few years per year, how much is our cash outlay for open? I'm just trying to get an idea of how, how fast we're going to go through the one point two million. Well, okay. you can you tell them, you say based on well, you know, like four percent discount rate. Which if you raise the discount rate so you go down. Well but I wasn't asking about the present value, just the cash outflow. But that, that that's part of the magic formula. Our annual required contribution, let's see. Town contributions, we've done around 250,000. We've paid out in cash, but we've tried to fund our liability, right? To, to fund our ARC at the $1.2 million mark. What is 250? It's two, right now, going forward, it's about 250 a year. That's what it's been, yeah, to yeah, pay as you go. We owe more. It's just for the cash. We've had this discussion before. The, the liability well, we'll increases over time. Well, we'll go up to a peak, and then it was going to lay off. Our 37 is more mortality rates and things like that that are eventually. Mm -hmm. Currently, we have 38 active positions, and I don't know the actual number of retirees right now. It's probably around 22, 20, 22. 25. Is it 25? So we have 60 people, and we're paying 250,000. So that's 4,000 each. So, and this number is moving because the actuarial assumptions are changing and they're um, evaluated every time we do this review. And also, um, the town is looking forward and you know, negotiating new benefit packages. And so that will also change going forward, you know, what the, um, the amount will be. Okay. So what decisions do we need to make today? Or what do we need to recommend? Today, we're here to talk about a strategy for investing the 1.2 approximate million that will be put into the trust in the name of the town for these types of medical benefits in the future. And so, um, and what is the recommendation? And so, um, you know, I wanted Andrew to talk with you a little bit and um, get a sense of what we're looking for and have him make a recommendation. I think um, PARS in general make, you know, comes up with kind of a, a conservatively moderate portfolio, but you know, based on the conversation here, he might be able to be a little bit more specific okay. targeting what he What's thinks would be um, a good strategy for us. I'm trying to look at what previous papers or, or exhibits you might have had from the, the last 
gentleman that was here. You know, um, Mitch gave us the notebooks. We didn't really go through them in very much detail. So if you have a handout, then then that would be great. We have just you know the information in the staff report that you reviewed. With yeah, and, and I apologize for the. I'm going to print that five. Can you two chair? Thanks. I'll share with that. I can share. Would you like a copy? Not necessary. I'll give it to you. All right. Thank you. All right. No problem. Sure. Okay, so what I've what I've uh, printed out and handed out here is um four investment sheets. And uh this describes our four platforms that we use. And, and the platforms, as a reminder, are, are investment objectives that, that have a certain asset allocation range. And, and we, we have uh, the names for these four investment objectives, and we name them conservative, moderately conservative, moderate, and moderate aggressive. And if you sort of look at the, the, the table insert at the top third of the page, and you see that the efficient frontier, so to speak, as you move from the bottom left to the upper right, you, you go from allocations that have more bonds and cash uh, to allocations that have more stocks than than. I'm sorry, where are you seeing that? Is that right here. Right here. Is a chart and the chart of the picture. Yeah. He's just saying as you go up the chart, it's more risky. As you go up the chart, it's more risky. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, what I try to do is I try to provide a recommendation uh, to a committee like this that says, okay, well, Nikolai in their study said that you're looking to get five and a half, or you're looking to get six percent. Okay, well, then I say, you know, based on our expected rates of return, what do I think investment objective might make the most sense to target that type of uh, target that's in your actual evaluation? It's somewhat, somewhat of a challenge because four percent is the number here. It, well, you don't have any numbers the, on your axis. Well, I think it's just a this is just an chart. exhibit. Um, okay. It's yeah. nice to see that the numbers on there. Yeah. But where is your four percent? The three point eight four. Well, no, I'm gonna I'm gonna go over yeah. with you verbally. Okay. Okay. So based on our expected rates of returns for stocks and bonds, cash, over the next five years. So right here, it's a little bit of a mismatch. So I just want to communicate that because we have a five-year horizon for expected rates of return, and you have a thirty-year horizon. So it's a little bit of a mismatch, but I think it's maybe more in line with what you were directionally offering a second ago. Um, but I still want to put that out there. We would uh, put forth that the moderately, uh, we'll start with the moderate aggressive, the most aggressive, we would say 6.7% return. And where are you looking there? I'm, gonna get, I'm giving it to you. So are the okay. moderate things looking at at all? Are we looking at these? The last uh, we we may have the numbers that aren't on here, and I just don't know what you're, what you're if seeing. If you ask me you? what these, these are performance sheets, so if you say, well, all right, it's great that you give me these numbers. What have you actually earned over the last? No, no I want to know where they are on the side to follow your presentation. They're not. All right. So I'm going to give it to you. So, so take on a moderately start. aggressive, we write 6.7. Yep. Right. Oh, balanced, moderately aggressive, 6.7. And, and then moderate is what? Six. Six. And balanced is? Uh, moderately balanced, conservative. Balanced, slash moderately aggressive is the, yeah. so the is moderately it? conservative one is yes. going from top to bottom. Yes. Yes. So moderately conservative, 5.3. Okay. And conservative, four, four, eight, eight, five. Four, eight, five. Okay. All right. Now that's what, what was the last one? Four, eight, five. Four, eight, five. Four, eight, five. So that's before any well, fees and taxes. You don't pay taxes. And if you look at five years, that's what the number is here on the chart. That is, well, that's what we're expecting the looking horizon. Forward. You're doing a forward looking yeah. based on the trends that you're seeing today. Yeah. And when you do your trend analysis to do your projections, do you go, how far back do you look? 35 years. Okay, so you're looking at the overall trend. All right, do you do a short-term horizon as well? We do well because it is a things have changed well, 35 years, given where we were and what we've just been going through. I don't think, I think that, you know, maybe going back 35 years, you kind of like, well, we, undid, undid the little the couple little blips that we had. The, the fixed yeah. income is a big thing. I mean, yeah. fixed income to depending upon short interview term or, or longer, I mean, we're, we're estimating two to three percent. So that definitely factors in, well, factors in where we're at, but why are we where we're at? It's because, you know, what, what's taking place over the last few years? Mm -hmm. so it's, it's, it, it is the bonds that, that are, let me put it this way, if I was here in 2007, and, and I was sharing it with what our conservative allocation, what we thought? It'd be three or four percent. Well, no, I mean, it'd be five-ish, because, yeah. 
Yeah. So, so where are you going to put the money, just as an example? Well, we, we do need to have these conversations. So you can... Well, let's let him finish this. Yeah. Okay. 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 Let's let him finish. So, so given 4%, uh, you know, if 4% was your number, then, then you know, I suppose you could do conservative and, and call it a day. But, but you truly do have a longer term time horizon. Uh, these liabilities will not be paid over you know, one year, two years. You paid over 30 years. And you do have the ability, since this is year one, sort of like if you have a kid who's one year's of age and they're not going to go to college until you know, 17 or 18, you can be a little bit more aggressive in, in your investment stance. You can be. Whether or not you choose to be, that's obviously the, the committee's decision. So, I mean, I certainly, it's not, it's not my job to say you must do this. But for the most part, uh, a lot of clients these days, are, well, the moderate allocation is our most popular uh, selection. Uh, the moderate allocation combined with maybe a 6% target rate of return. That's where a lot of committees are coming down because, you know, they are a little bit scared of uh, excessive equity allocation, even though they may have a longer term time horizon to, to make it up. Um, so so that, that's, that seems to be a, a match that I see often. Less and less am I seeing 7.75% is in our expected rate of return and, and you know, select the balance moderately aggressively. So going down, then you have you know you have uh, your different instruments. Yep. And then you've got strategic range policy and tactical. Right. So that. each each one of these four handouts that I, I presented to you uh, depicts either conservative, moderate, conservative, moderate, and moderate aggressive. And on each one of these pages, you'll see the strategic asset allocation range that we use for stocks, bonds, and cash. So just looking at the conservative one as an example, the equity or stocks can range from five to twenty percent. Bonds can go from 60 to 95 percent, and cash can go from zero to 20 percent. And so, okay, well, we have to have a, a point within that, those ranges that, that we, we utilize, and, and that really comes from our, our firm's asset allocation committee. Currently, the asset allocation committee is, is positing a 17 percent allocation for stocks, 78 for bonds, and 5 percent in cash. And, and I'm getting that in the tactical part right here. So that's that's. Uh... And they, and they update that annually? We meet monthly to review our tactical position between stocks, bonds, and cash. Okay. Okay. But you're currently earning the uh, year to date 3.84. These performance pages are through March 31. Um, and so if you, if you look at these two columns, if you will, uh, the column on your left shows the active platform. So the actively managed mutual funds that perhaps the committee is not interested in, in reviewing, the active platform is depicted on the, the left. On the right-hand side, um, as Alan started off with, with an index-based uh, set of index funds, um, that would be the index-based platform on the right-hand side. So these are the returns, historical returns for our composite, uh, for, in this case, the conservative, and as you go through the exhibits, the moderate conservative yes. moderate. So in your bond portfolio, you must have a, a lot of uh, old bonds that are yielding fairly good returns. Uh, to, to the question of what we're invested in, if it's on the index side, we're invested in the Barclays Aggregate Index Fund. So they're not individual funds, per se. They're, they're, they're index funds. And then on the, the mutual fund platform, we have uh, the PEMCO Total Return Bond Fund, the Highmark Bond Fund, and then a Vanguard short-term corporate admiral uh, in, uh, index fund that we actually use for the yeah. And these are the current yields on those funds? These would be the current returns on, so, so what the investment returns are, uh, which are a little bit different than the yield. I mean, the, the yield would be, in our eyes, what the cash generation is for the funds. Uh, the total return would be, okay, well, let's say you got 3% in, in the coupon, but it went down a percent, then we would look at the return, then it, it, I guess, positive two percent. Um, so, so what you're looking at here are investment returns uh, for the individual, uh, for uh, investment objectives for the various time periods that, that we've been managing the, uh, so we're managing the platform. So where we have Highmark plus active, these are these numbers are net of the management fees. Okay. These are net of the embedded fund fees that you would either see on the actively managed investment platform 
or well, converse on the index platform, but yeah. index is a lot smaller. Yeah. It is not net of any cars or investment management fees. Mm -hmm. So, so they're gross of those expense fees, uh, but they are net of um, the fund fees. It's just when uh, when returns are low, then these fees can consume a very high share of your return. So what are your fees generally? Based on 1.2 million, do you have the, um, the year? Or 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 the year? For this, okay, so PARS, so remember, I, I represent Highmark Capital, yeah. not PARS, PARS is the record keeper. PARS would charge under 5 million, 0.25%. Now that's whether it's the active platform or the index platform, doesn't matter, that's 0.25%. My fee, well, not my personal fee, but, but, but the investment management fee, 0.35 percent under five million. So is that same or equity? equity? Oh, I'm sorry. Regardless of whether it's debt or equity. Well, regardless of if it's conservative, moderate, conservative, moderate, or moderate aggressive, because all four of these are going to have some combination of, of debt and equity funds. So if we uh, decide to invest in 85 percent debt. Would you pay the same fee as if we had a balanced aggressive fee? You pay the same fee, or you absolutely why? Um, um, risk for equities are so much greater. The the, the fees here are, are for the management fees, and not necessarily for um, I guess the the, you know, the ambitious or, or lack of ambition for, for the target return. But in my personal portfolio, the rate charged on bonds is like 0.25, and the rate charged on equities is like 1.0. I think that the dynamic that it, you get from what you're describing would certainly be on the embedded, the embedded expense at the fund level, because well, at the mutual fund level, if you're looking at the active side, you know the Pemco total return bond funds 0.45 percent, and the equity funds, on average, usually have a one percent right. embedded expense. But for what we do for the asset allocation, for, for the record keep, well, we do the asset allocation, we do the investing, pars on the record keeping. The, yeah, that's you know, the trust administration fee yeah. and the consulting fee is what we just quoted. So yours really is a, it's an administration fee. Huh? Mine's a, mine's the investment management. Pars would be, I, I'll call it administration. Yeah, yeah. pars so so the administration yeah. oversight, and, and, and the high mark is doing the investment, and so. You know, I think that, that Greg had a great comment. Is that. Uh, if it's exactly the same for the active versus the passive, it looks a little more balanced. But so regardless, regardless oh, I have oh, 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 wait a minute. Okay. I want to say the last part again. I want to make sure that. I said if, if, if the fee is the same for the active versus the passive, okay. it seems okay. a tad bit unbalanced. That is a correct statement. It is a correct statement that PARS and HIMARS <clears throat> We charge the same fee whether it's actively managed or mm -hmm. passively managed. Now, now, the but here, though, and this is what I want to make sure that everybody is clear about, is that there are embedded expenses within either the index funds, right, mm -hmm. or the actively managed funds. So if you're going in and out of the funds, there's additional charge. That we utilize now. Okay. Now, that, that is, well, that should also be factored in. And for that, the, the index funds are much, much cheaper. Basically, across the board, from conservative to moderate, well, balanced, moderately aggressive, the embedded expenses that you would see for index funds are anywhere between 0.22 on conservative to 0.24 for the balanced, moderately aggressive. That definitely is less expensive. Okay. So, so there's additional fees. To yeah. Down. If you yeah. go into the active, which, right. which I would have expected, there would be right. additional fees as you're jumping it. Oh, I don't know. And right. so you're the active, jumping, but you're changing uh, as you're changing that. There's a fee for exiting. There's a there's a commission fee for getting in. The, well, there's not a commission fee. It's just more the management fee that okay. the funds charge. And so, so comparing that 0.22 to the 0.24 versus the index. It's probably about a half a percent more expensive on the actively managed platform. So that I question about for who I want to. Um, well, go ahead, finish it. Well, no, I, 
Yeah. By the, uh, the the mutual fund family, the, the mutual mm -hmm. funds that we invest in. No, it didn't. It just kind of fell down. The tree just went down. I don't know. I didn't hear anybody. We hit. Well, I don't know. The mutual funds. Well, yeah, it was a tree. A big tree went just went down right outside the window. I didn't hear anybody cutting it, so I assume it just fell over. Okay, okay. See, it was exciting here. So you're saying mutual funds are charging us based on the risk and their whether it's an equity fund or a debt fund? The mutual funds would charge you well. They'll charge you more for the equity. I don't necessarily know if it's based on um, based on the risk. It's probably more so based on, 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 on the return and what they would call the experience and expertise that they're, they're offering. For the active management. For the active management. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Sure. So is this saying, you know, on the conservative, you said 4.85. You would then have to subtract 0.6, which makes that 4.25? If you were to do a, a net of fees, and you were to say, okay, well, I noticed, Andrew, that you made 4.84% over the last five years in this actively managed platform. What was the total net return? That would be then, you 4.25. So you take the 60 mm -hmm. basis points off, and that would have been the experience of anybody who was in this over the last five years. So that would be and a net who, return. Whose fee is that? Yours or the mutual funds? The 0.6. The 0.6 is. It's PERS and it's in yeah, PARS, 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 PARS. I, I occasionally say that. <coughs> so PARS as well as HIMAR. That's our fee. Well, then we're, at, we're just paying you for an asset allocation fee. You're playing, paying me for asset allocation, you're paying me for investment management. Um, investment on, management in what platform. way? Sorry? Investment management in what way? I mean, you're giving us an asset allocation. Oh, the asset allocation, the selection of the funds, the execution of the trades. Um, we have an investment policy that they help That's us to awesome. write and review every year. They make sure that we're all in line with the investment policy. And we do get um, statements every month that will show what the actual um, net returns are. 